Morning. How's everybody doing? Good? Good? You good? Okay. Hey, I'm going to give you a quick recap of kind of where we've been and where we're going uh, real quick. Uh, so we've been in this series called Asking for a Friend for the month of July, and then this is our last week here at the end of August. So we're going to be going back into our study of the Gospel of John. That's kind of where we started the year, and we're working our way through that. Brandon is going to bring us back into that study next week. We'll be starting in Chapter 8, so I'm going to give you some other homework, but some of your homework can be to start reading ahead in Chapter 8, get yourself kind of anchored and acquainted with where we're going to be. But this series we've been doing this summer, how many of you have enjoyed this series? Yeah, handful? Okay, good. Uh, so we've been going week by week and answering questions that we took in from all of you for about six weeks before the series started. And the reason we call this series Asking for a Friend is because these maybe are questions that you, maybe you're, you're embarrassed to ask because you think, gosh, everybody else probably knows the answer to this. Or if I ask that question, people are going to think I'm a terrible person or whatever. And so you tag the phrase, asking for a friend. Like, hey, I got a friend who's wondering. And so I told you in the beginning, these are all completely anonymous questions. And so today I have a picture of the friend that you've all been referring to. This is the friend right here. <laughs> that poor fellow right there is the friend that you've all been asking these questions for. We're going to wrap this up today. And uh, we're going to move back into our study of the Gospel of John. But today I want to be where we are. So we have a few questions left to take care of. Now, I will tell you, I didn't get through all the questions. So if I asked you a question and you want to talk about it, please just come and find me. Uh, I'm happy to address any of those questions that your friend has. And, and we can even, maybe we'll put that picture of the bear up while we're talking about it, just so, we, so we're all clear. But... So I'm going to try to tackle as many of these as I can, and uh, it's crunch time, so let's jump into it. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I do thank you so much for today. And Lord, I thank you for this time in this series as we've been looking at these questions. And, and so it's, it's refreshing, Lord, to know that there's not questions that are too hard. And so God, the whole time through this series, our goal has been to uh, speak on these questions as you speak through your word on these questions and to be silent in answering these questions where your word is silent about these questions. So today, God, it's no different. That's the prayer today, is that we can bring these questions to your word and find answers. And Lord, that you would accomplish the purpose that you have. Holy Spirit, be active. We, we, we ask for encouragement where encouragement is needed. We ask for conviction where conviction is needed. And Lord, that everything that we say and do in here would bring glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to jump right in. The first question we have today, uh, question number one. My friend is wondering if prayer or the number of people praying changes God's mind. So there was a couple questions that had this kind of theme, so I did condense these a little bit. Uh, and I want to look at a few things to help us understand this question and this answer. So letter A, we're going to look at first God's character. Letter A is God's character. Numbers 23, 19, God is not man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. He has said it and will he not do it or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? So before we move into kind of the answer to this question, I want to start with the foundation. Okay? I want to start with the foundation. God is perfect and actually his plan is perfect. He has a perfect plan for everything. You've heard me say this before. If I thought I was wrong, I would change my mind. Right? And I've said before, I've kind of made a case for that before, that most of us, even if we wouldn't make that statement, we probably live that statement out, right? We don't typically take a left when we feel like we know we need to take a right, right? When we're driving somewhere. Like, if we, if we thought we were wrong, we would change our mind. This is one of the aspects about God that we need to remember, that he knows everything. We've covered that. He knows how everything is going to work out. He sees the beginning from the end. He has a perfect plan that doesn't need to change. So in the midst of that plan, he can use imperfect people and imperfect situations to accomplish his plan. Prayer is one of the greatest ways that we 
align ourselves with God's will and with God's plan. So the short answer to this question, we're gonna, I promise I'm going to give you a little more to work with here, but the short answer to this question, uh, does prayer or getting uh, numbers of people to pray change God's mind? The, question, the answer to the question is no. We don't change God's mind by praying or getting others to pray. And that can be very confusing and, and perhaps off-putting to some of you. But I want to look at this a little bit farther and see what does Scripture tell us about praying? Because at that point, we might be saying, why do we pray? So God gives us some principles for prayer, and, and I'm going to refer to this in a little bit. This isn't going to be an exhaustive uh, treatise of the theology of prayer. I'm just going to give you that heads up before we start. But letter B here in this answer is we're, we're told to pray about everything. We're told to pray about everything. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So when we pray about everything, we are able to align ourselves with God. We're able to align ourselves with God. We're able to let him know the things that we're worrying about what we're thinking about when we're trying to fall asleep or what's on our mind when we wake up at 3 in the morning. How many of you have that 3 in the morning thing? What is with the de- what's the deal with 3 in the morning, right? Like, hey, hoping to like sleep through that, but but in those times in everything, God is inviting you to call out to him. God desires to hear the burdens of your heart. It's good to look at a couple things in those verses that we see when we get that instruction to pray about everything. That we don't need to be anxious about anything. We don't need to be anxious about anything. And that we're, we're to pray about everything. It's very clear that prayer is not about changing God's mind. Prayer is about changing our mind. We get a really good deal because we get to trade anxiety for peace right trade yeah so how many of you Facebook marketplace how many of you have ever used Facebook marketplace okay all right Facebook marketplace here's the deal when you post something on Facebook marketplace even if you just have a monetary value on it you will get offers to trade for said item Okay, you're going to receive offers. They might not all be good offers. One time Liam was trying to sell some toys, kids' toys, little kids' toys. And this guy messaged me and he said, Hey, would you be willing to trade a $65 bottle of wine? <laughs> and I just responded, My son is 11. <laughs> right? I think, I think we're done. I think we're done with this thread, right? Or like you'll have something on there and you have a price on it and it's whatever it is and somebody's going to say like, hey, would you be interested in the front fender from a 1989 Chevy Citation and a half a pack of gum and you come to me, right? Like that's kind of how, how this stuff works. When we trade things in life, oftentimes it's not really a good deal, Right? It's kind of like that. When we submit to God's call on us to pray about everything, God uses prayer to take our anxiety and turn it into peace. We give him anxiety and he gives us peace. It's a great trade for us. It's a fantastic trade for us. And it, and it really, to me, when we look at that, it feels like I'm giving God the fender and the pack of gum. Right? That's what it feels like. The other principle that we see here, letter C, if you're taking notes here, is we're also told to pray without ceasing. Told to pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. Simple verse, everybody can, that can be your memory verse. Right? Once you get Jesus wept down, then you can work on pray without ceasing. But, so pray without ceasing, that means never stop praying. So, okay, school starts in what, like a week and a half, right? 
Okay, so when you're supposed to get up and get your stuff together and go to school, kids, you can be like, um, I'm praying. <laughs> Sorry, I can't, can't go to school, I have to pray. Or tomorrow when you have to go to work and your boss is like, yeah, we're going to need some production out of you. You're like, hey, boss, sorry, I'm praying. God told me, pray without ceasing. So I just have to keep praying. Obviously, that's not exactly what this means, right? It's a call for us as followers of Christ to live our lives constantly focused on him, constantly talking to him, constantly thinking about him, constantly praying about everything all the time. Prayer should be the first thing, not the all we can do now is pray thing. Okay? When we, how many of us have said that sentence? Right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. We're going to get to lying a little bit later in this message, just so you know. But the concept is to live in a way that, that understands and acknowledges that God is near to us. We've talked about the nearness of God a few different times. We've talked about it as it pertains to finding God, to salvation, and the nearness of God to those who are crushed in spirit. We've talked about the nearness of God. And we, we, when we have this attitude that we're praying about everything and we're doing it all the time, we're a people that are aligning ourself with God's will and God's plan. Prayer is not about changing God's mind. It's about changing our mind. We can see the fruit of this in Paul's words to the Colossian church, Colossians 4, 2. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it, being watchful in prayer with thanksgiving. So you're praying and you're watching and you're being thankful with what you see as you watch. So when you have this attitude and this heart about praying all the time about everything, you begin to recognize God moving in your life because you're being watchful in prayer, with thanksgiving. You see things that you've been anxious about because we've given him our anxiety and we're getting peace. So we begin to see those things that we've been anxious about and we start to see God's fingerprints on them in our lives. And then we give thanksgiving for that. You see the burdens of your heart that you've been handing over to God being alleviated. Maybe the situation's not fixed the way that you prayed for it to be fixed, but what you begin to see is those burdens being alleviated and you see God's hand on it. Praying about everything and praying without ceasing cause you to do a couple things. This, this should cause you to, to give thanks to God for the work that he's constantly doing in your life. It helps you recognize the work that God's doing in your life. And it should also cause you to be sharing those stories with the people around you and the people that you've been asking to pray with you about that thing. Because part of this question is about getting more people to pray for something. So when you're steadfastly continuing in prayer with thanksgiving, you're sharing that with the people that you've been inviting to pray with you about that thing. So for us, let's do this. Let's Let's remember that prayer is about changing our mind, and, and maybe I should be saying our heart, but changing our mind, not changing God's mind. And let's, let's make a fresh commitment to personal times of prayer, personal times of releasing burdens to the Lord. Let's make a fresh commitment to praying with others, to asking others to pray for things, to, to ask others, what can I pray for with you? There's a lot more I could say about this, and we, we again, this isn't a full treatise on prayer, but we have a four-part series on prayer on our YouTube channel. By the way, good job. Some of you found the fire emoji last week. Good job. Feel free to like and subscribe when you're watching. The algorithm likes it. Okay, second question. My friend is wondering how long a biblical generation is. Now, there was a note on this question uh, that just said Matthew 24. And so when we look at Matthew 24, I believe we're seeing this scripture, Matthew 24, 34. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So the question is, what are, what are the things that Jesus is talking about? What are, until all these things take place? When we read Matthew 24, we read that a lot last year, didn't we? When we were going through Revelation, that was your homework quite a few times. 
to read Matthew 24. Mark 13 is a parallel passage, right? So Matthew 24, Mark 13, parallel passages in Scripture. You can read both of those chapters again for your homework today. <clears throat> but this is the chapter in Matthew where Jesus is talking a lot about the last days. We call it end times, last days. He talks about signs that we would be able to see letting us know that the end was coming. Um, side note, as you read and do your homework, you're going to see that that's also the place where we see that only the Father knows the day and the hour. Okay? So make sure you read that part too. <clears throat> because when we ask a question like this, we're not asking this question to try to kind of figure out where we are and set a date. That's not the idea. But there is a couple key takeaways as it relates to this question. Letter A, and this, this, is, this is kind of the answer for everything we ever do, but letter A is context is key. Context is key. So some of the context of Matthew 24, we're saying uh, this generation won't pass away until all these things take place. So some of the things that Jesus is talking about, future events in Matthew 24. So false claims of Christ's return in verses 4 through 8. We see a, an increase in persecution and lawlessness in verses 9 through 13. Fulfillment of prophecies in, in verses 15 through 31. Bringing in the greater context of Matthew 24 and even looking into Matthew 25 helps us see that Jesus is talking about future events. That this is a prophecy that Jesus is giving. And, and that these events in this chapter and the things that Jesus is saying uh, will happen before that generation passes away. So the generation, this doesn't so much give us a, a length of time about the length of a generation, but it tells us that there will be a generation that will be alive when these things happen that won't pass away before the end comes. So that tells us letter B, that the end is quick. It tells us that the end is quick. So that parallel passage, Mark 13, 20, and if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. Now there's a whole lot theologically going on there that I'm not unpacking right now, okay? But what we know from that is that this is quick. That this is a quick, quick event, quick thing. Jesus is not saying that the generation in the first century that he was saying this to would not pass away before these things all happened. He's prophesying about future events that would happen. And, and what this does is it helps us reinforce our answer from last week when we were asked, is the Bible relevant for us today or is it a collection of good stories that were good a couple thousand years ago? This helps us understand that the Bible is, in fact, relevant for us today. It's relevant for people in the first century, in the 21st century, and if Jesus doesn't come back 2,000 years from now, it's going to be relevant for those folks too. It means that we have to live a life following Jesus that understands that there is a day coming when all this comes to an end. There's a time when the age of grace ends and there's going to be a time of judgment. The Christian Missionary Alliance Statement of Faith has a section about the, the second coming of Jesus. It says, The second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is imminent and will be personal, visible, and premillennial. This is the believer's blessed hope and is a vital truth, which is an incentive to holy living and faithful service. Again, there's a whole bunch going on theologically in here that I'm not unpacking today, but we've unpacked that in some other videos. You can check those out. What does this do for us? What is asking this question about what is, what is the length of a biblical generation, Matthew 24? When we look at Scripture and we start to find that answer and we, we see that maybe it's not going to be the answer that we were looking for necessarily, but we've learned something. So what has it taught us? It shows us that every follower of Jesus has to have an awareness of the time around us. The time and the times that we live in. But more than just an awareness, this isn't just an awareness so that we can get excited thinking, 
Maybe we're the generation that won't pass away before these things happen. That's not the goal. Do you understand that? That that's not the goal. We're not trying to figure out if we're the the generation that's not going to pass away. That's not the goal. The goal is this. That when we understand the greater context of Matthew 24 and that we understand that the end is quick, that it should cause us to live with a sense of urgency for all of the people that we know and love and interact with that don't know Jesus. Because if we believe what, what Jesus is saying in Matthew 24, and I sure hope we do, it should cause us to, to shift our priorities away from the temporary to the eternal. Shifting away from the temporary to the eternal. Yes, maintain your responsibilities. Yes, be stewards of what God has provided for you. Yes, live life in a way that helps you to be a good citizen and all those things that are uh, having good morals and all of those things. But focus on eternity, not temporary things. All of those things that we maybe look at and hold on to very closely, we have to learn to hold them pretty loosely because they're all going to get rolled up like a scroll someday. So if nothing else happens from answering this question, it should reignite our focus on eternity rather than on here and now. Okay, number three. My friend is wondering if God ever blesses lying. And the con- no, this is good. The context of this question, there was, there was Jehu and Rahab, kind of the stories of Jehu and Rahab. And, and actually, when you start to dig into Scripture, there's a whole bunch of lying going on in there. A bunch of lying liars. <laughs> so Jehu specifically, again, just for the sake of time, I can't fully develop the whole thing, but uh, Jehu, what he did is he lied about his plan to serve Baal when he was anointed king of Israel. Uh, 2 Kings 10, 18 and 19 is where we see this. Then Jehu assembled all the people and said to them, Ahab served Baal a little, but Jehu will serve him much. Now therefore come to me all the prophets of Baal, all his worshippers and his priests. Let none, let none be missing, for I have a great sacrifice to offer to Baal. Whoever is missing shall not live. But Jehu did it with cunning in order to destroy the worshippers of Baal. So quick background, catching up to date. Again, I don't have all the time to develop the whole story. But Ahab, how many of you remember Ahab was like probably the worst of the worst, right? You guys remember that? Uh, he worshipped Baal, did lots of terrible things as king. And so Jehu is saying here, oh, <laughs> you think Ahab was a worshiper of Baal. You have seen nothing yet. Wait till you see what I'm going to do to worship Baal. In fact, all of you need to be here at one time because this is going to be huge, right? So he gets all these prophets of, uh, that were worshiping Baal into one spot so that he can kill them. God's reaction is, is interesting. In verse 30 of that same chapter, the Lord said to Jehu, Because you have done well in carrying out what is right in my eyes, and have done the house of Ahab, done to the house of Ahab according to all that was in my heart, your sons of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. So if you keep reading, you're going to find out that Jehu didn't do so hot after this. Like he did kind of for a little while, but not really. He kind of did like halfway. He was like one of the less bad kings of Israel. <laughs> like not good for sure, but not Ahab. So if it's on like a, if, if it was on a spectrum, he's going to be toward the Ahab side farther than the Josiah side, we'll just say. So did God bless his lying? That's kind of the question that's being asked. I would hesitate to use the word bless. I think that God was pleased with the outcome. Scripture definitely teaches us that he was pleased with the outcome. Kind of leaves us in a strange spot. Uh, he had called for the Baal worshippers to be eradicated from Israel. 
But Jehu still did a lot of bad stuff after that. There's lots of examples in Scripture where folks were dishonest. Like I said, there's a lot of lying liars in Scripture. Uh, the midwives that hid Moses when, when they're asked, you know, hey, why aren't we, why aren't we getting these babies out? Well, the, they, they take longer. They're, they're, they're quicker. They're quicker. We can't get there in time, right? Rahab lied about the whereabouts of the spies that Joshua sent into the land. And if you think about that even a little bit farther, Joshua sent spies into the land. Is that honest? Is spying honest? <laughs> this gets difficult. This gets difficult. There's a lot to consider. And so I want to show you quickly why I appreciate this question. I'm going to get back to the specifics of it in a minute. But I want to bring in now, before we feel like we're getting permission <laughs> to, to leave from here and go, well, if I'm going to lie, I'm lying for the Lord, and here it goes. <laughs> right? There's a concept when we bring in the whole counsel of Scripture. Remember, context is key. So when we bring in the whole counsel of Scripture, there's a couple of concepts that I want to make sure we get before I bring this answer out. But letter A is that integrity brings security. Integrity brings security. Proverbs 10.9, whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but he who makes his ways crooked will be found out. Proverbs, man, it's like, oh yeah, you got me. Oh yeah, that makes sense, right? When you read Proverbs, you should get a dose of that. You should get some like, yeah, that's correct. How many of us from our own life experiences just like, as soon as we see this idea of integrity bringing us security, we're like, yep, that makes sense. How many of you have ever told a lie? If you didn't raise your hand, you're lying. <laughs> Trying to come into church and say that you have never told a lie. Mm-mm. -mm. But, but seriously, we've all experienced this. We tell a lie or a small lie, what we think is a small lie, and then we have to remember what we lied about and who we lied to so that the next time that subject comes up, we're like, oh, what did I tell him last time? Now i got to try to remember that, right? How many of you are old enough that you have a hard time just remembering the truth? Like, I am, seriously, like, I'm, I'm talking to, like, I'm coaching football at the high school, and so these kids, I'm talking to them about some things from when I was playing football and stuff, and I'm like, I don't even remember. I, I want to tell them a true story, and I can't even sometimes remember the truth. But when we make integrity uh, just a cornerstone, just a, a non-negotiable cornerstone of our life, then we have security in all of our interactions with others. It's just what happens. When you have integrity as a non-negotiable, then you just have security. You're not constantly trying to remember what story you told who and how big the fish was when you told that story, right? It's just, just tell the truth, just have integrity. And the other thing we learn in, when we bring in the whole counsel of Scripture is letter B here, that integrity is our witness, Integrity is our witness. 2 Peter 2.12 Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So let's be honest here. No pun intended. We live in a world that does not have a high value on integrity. We have, we have people across the globe that are spending 40 or more hours a week trying to come up with ways to scam you. And then it's kind of like, hey, maybe just take those same hours and go get a job and produce something and take your paycheck and, and that'll be great. So when you're truthful, when you have integrity in your interactions, you're behaving in a way that is for the most part countercultural. You're behaving in a way that is for the most part countercultural, even in your Facebook marketplace interactions. You can still have integrity. When, when people know that you have made a decision to follow Jesus, when people know that, they are watching you. They are watching you. Whether you want them to watch you or not is not up to you. 
People are watching you. So they want to know how, yes, how you're going to handle that bad news from the doctor, right? They want to know, how do we do this? How, I don't have that hope that you seem to have when I get this bad news. They also want to know, how are you going to respond when your neighbor's dog uses your perfect lawn as a toilet again? What are you going to do about that, Christian? How are you going to get back at them, Christian, right? But they're also watching you to see what you do when you have an opportunity to compromise your integrity for something that will give you even just a little bit of self-gain. Right? Because we all end up in those situations. We do. And they're watching. What are you going to do, Christian, when you could very easily compromise your integrity and receive a little bit of benefit from it? How are you going to handle that situation? And our integrity is our witness, not our witness of being good people. We're not good people. You're not. We're not good people. We're sinners in need of a Savior. Okay? So it's, Christianity is not about having good morals and being good people. Christianity is about realizing my sin has separated me from a holy God and that he provided his son who lived a perfect life and died in my place so that I could be restored to relationship with him. And so if you think your integrity is just making people know that you're a good person, you've missed it. Your integrity is your witness to your heart that's been changed by the indwelling power of God. When you choose to anchor yourself in integrity, you're witnessing the power of Christ in your life. You're showing those who are watching you that there is something way more important than getting ahead for you. that it's more important for you to do what pleases God and what's honoring to him every time, all the time. And to trust in God's protection and God's provision, not the protection and provision from dishonesty. And then the last thing we see before I get to the end of this is that God is truth. You know, we hear so many like, God is love, God is this, God is, God is truth. Hebrews 6, 17 and 18, so when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his promise, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for, the refu- for refuge might find strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We looked at the fact that God can't lie in our first question. Don't you praise God for that? Amen. Aren't you glad that God can't lie? Aren't you glad that God's not going to be like, you know what? I was kidding. (laughs) Right? Or I got a better offer. Right? Or like, hey, that whole eternal life thing, I lied about that. I, I actually can't do that. Aren't you glad that when God makes us a promise that he's not going to change it and that he can't lie about it? When you read this passage of Hebrews chapter 6, it talks about how God swore by himself because there was nothing greater to swear by. He's it. He is the pinnacle. He's the beacon of truth. So what do we do of these times, with these times in Scripture where folks lied and it, it didn't seem like God condemned their lie? there's a couple quick things to consider that these instances where people lied and God didn't seem to rebuke them for their lies are times where people, for the most part, what we see is people are interacting with people who by their own actions have forfeited their right to know the truth. Okay, these would be like times of war, right? We don't have to submit and email our battle plan to the enemy. Does that make sense? Right? Like we don't have to be like, well, I'm a Christian, so I just got to let you know, we're going to be moving a whole battalion over here, and we're coming from this side, and so that's not how it works all the time, right? How about if you're being robbed and you're like, hey, no problem, but my buddy is around the corner and he's got a big dog and a lead pipe, right? I think you can lie in that situation if you need to, right? Because this person who is holding you at gunpoint or whatever has forfeited their right to know the truth at that point. But these are extremes. These are extremes. 
Does God bless lying? I'd say no. Does God use the lies of broken people for his purposes sometimes? Yes. When people who are dealing with people who are launching an assault on God and the things of God and the people of God, we see that happening. But hear me on this. This doesn't mean that you can just lie to people that you know aren't Christians. We don't just make a category and say, well, I can lie to non-Christians because they're not people of God and they've forfeited their right to learn the truth. That's not what I'm saying here. These are very extreme examples in Scripture. Some might try to say that, that the lies given in these examples from Scripture are even the lesser of two evils in that given circumstance or situation. God uses the behavior of imperfect people and their response to these lesser of evil situations in his plan because his plan is perfect. He used, as we look at the history of through Israel, through the divided kingdom, we see God using evil leaders to bring judgment on his people for ignoring call after call after call by prophets to stop wandering and come back. And even after that, he uses more evil people to punish the evil people because they were being too hard on his people. He can use our sin and our bad choices and turn them into steps in his plan and use them for his purposes. That's the reason that Jesus can be this perfect sacrifice. Because he comes as that perfect. He lives that perfect life. Goes through the situations that we all go through, but does all of it without sinning. And he goes to the cross in my place, in your place, and makes the sacrifice, sheds his blood to wash away those sins so that we can be put in right relationship with God and spend all of eternity with him. And we know that because God promised that. And so God's not changing his mind about that. And so those things that we're worried about that, that are keeping us up at night, we surrender those to him. In fact, during this closing song, I invite you to do that. If you just have something that you just need to surrender, now is a great time because you can give it to God. You can give him the anxiety you have over it and he's going to give you peace. I'm going to have the worship team come up. We're going to have a closing song. I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, I do thank you so much for this time. Thank you for these questions, Lord. Thank you that we've, we've dug into your word and sought answers. And Lord, there have been times where we've had to remain silent on them because you were silent. And so we submit all of those times to your sovereignty, to your goodness, to the attributes that you are, that we've learned about you. We thank you that you give us promises that we can cling to with all security. And Lord, we cling very closely to that promise of eternal life for all of those who believe in the sacrifice that your son made, that his Death, burial, and resurrection was all sufficient for us to be restored to you. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.